Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm, a jolly warm welcome from all of us at the Visio Care Services team. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, myself tonight. I'm Karen Brad Murray. I'm a sales and marketing manager for Visio Care Services. And we've put together a really exciting new program of webinars in collaboration with the magazine, The Veterinary Edge. And tonight, we're joined by the very eminent Professor Dick White, who will be introduced formally to you shortly by our colleague and, uh, and friend, Mr. Philippe Moreau. Philippe joins us all the way from France. Philippe has been a veterinary surgeon for a few years, he told me how many, and was practicing in neurology and internal medicine. Philippe is, in fact, the founder of our product, of all the Busy Care services, and you're going to get a little bit of a taster of some of the amazing animations that I know Philippe and Dick have put together over the years when Dick gives his amazing talk. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Philippe, all the way from France, who's going to moderate the rest of the evening, and I'll join you right back at the end for a little summary of uh, where we are. So welcome, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Sit back, relax, have a nice glass of wine, and listen to us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Um, before uh, I introduce uh, my friend, Dick White, just a few comments on the logistic of the webinars. Um, we will like very much you to put all the questions and comments that you may have during the course of the webinar in the chat room. So please use the chat room. And at the end of Dick's presentation, I will use those questions to start and initiate the, the interactions. So remember to use the chat room. The webinar will be also recorded. So, you know, feel free to use the replay when you, when you wish for yourself, for your team members, uh, eventually some friends that could not attend today. So uh, I don't want to take too much time, but it's a privilege to introduce Dick White. When I found out that he was uh, going to be, you know, participating, I said, I want to present, I want to be the moderator. Yeah, because uh, I've never been your moderator, Dick. And uh, however, I've known Dick for many, many years. And it's, it's really an honor for me to, to, to play that role tonight. So I, I'm, I'm not going to spend 30 minutes introducing yourself because uh, it will be too short. You have done so, many, so much stuff for the profession, for veterinary surgery. Dick is a soft tissue surgeon, a professor at the University of Nottingham. He was uh, also a professor at Cambridge University way back before in 2003. He saw the light and he started his own practice called Dick White Referrals. And it was a crazy idea, but it became a fantastic success. Dick White Referrals is today one of the largest and most well-known referral practice in Europe. And I know and, and he is very proud and he can be very proud of this achievement. Uh, Dick has given lectures all over the world. He's also the founder of the European College of Veterinary Surgery. So, um, he has so many credentials that time is too short and I don't want to take the time away from his presentation. He's going to talk to us about ear disease and he knows this topic in and out because his specialty is focusing on soft tissue but with a special interest on ear, nose and throat. So, Dick, thank you again for being with us tonight. Good, Philippe. Thank you very much. Cheers. I found during the last year with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that alcohol has been a very effective uh, antiviral medication. So I've been taking quite a lot of it, I have to say. So thank you very much. Let me just uh, see if we can go on to our full screen. Are we all able to see that? Yes? Can we see that or not? Just coming, Dick, I think. Not yet. Is that up? No. No? Yeah, I don't see the full screen. I just see okay. yourself and the four of us, or the three of we us. Just do uh, that. We'll share. And can we see? Can we see that? Yes, 
Dick, we see your screen, management of chronic changes in the external and middle ear of the dog. Wonderful, good. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming and joining us. And thank you particularly to Vizio Care and to Philippe, uh, with whom I worked for a number of years developing some of the Vizio Care products. And you're going to see some of our uh, 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 3D animation later on this evening. So um, my name is Dick White. As Philippe said, I'm a very old soft tissue surgeon. I had a lot of interest in head and neck surgery. Um, I don't do much clinical work at the moment. I'm very much involved in uh, European insure, pet insurance uh, services. Um, but I hope that we can have a useful discussion tonight on, on this topic. Um, when we thought about a topic for June, we thought, well, the summer should be there. At the time, it was freezing cold and uh, snowing. But thankfully, the summer has, a, has arrived. And uh, it's a really very hot day, certainly here in the east of England. So we're going to talk about a presentation that's common during the summer, and those that, that's ear disease in the dog. Uh, but particularly, I want to focus on the management of the chronic ear diseases that, that we see. And so these are the kind of patients that uh, come and see us in June or July with the beginnings of their ear problems. But we're still seeing in September, October, November, December. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the external and middle ear. Importantly, we'll talk about how disease arises in the external and middle ear and how it becomes chronic. And then looking at some decision making, when is it time to move from medical to surgical management? Uh, and finally, then we'll look at total ear canal ablation. And I'm a great believer that with just one or two very simple uh, guiding principles, total ear canal can be a very safe and a very successful procedure. So, um, you know, I want you to be able to feel confident that you can do this procedure with the minimum of fuss. And you don't have to be a surgical specialist. You don't have to listen to surgical specialists when we do this. So let's begin by looking at the anatomy, first of all, of the external ear. <clears throat> and the external ear is based around a number of cartilages, as we can, can see here. And we'll see in this animation then how the cartilages provide the structure for the, sorry, for the uh, external ear. Let's just see if we can stop that when we get to the interesting bit. Okay, and just to arrest it there. So the these cartilages form the chassis for the external ear. And of course, they're attached then to the osseous, the lateral osseous part of the, the middle ear uh, structure there. Okay, what's the function of the external ear? The main function is sound collection. And in the human, of course, we've lost the ability to move the external ear. But in the dog, we still see that. It depends on the breed, of course. don't see it much in spaniels, but you can see it in uh, dogs with standing up ears. And you see it especially in cats. Cats have ability to turn their uh, external ear through 180 degrees to collect sound. And that's essentially what it does with its complex auricular muscles. <clears throat> it has a secondary role in protecting the uh, middle ear and the inner ear structures. So let's look at our animation of the uh, external ear. And sorry, let's just back up again. And we can see how the cartilages are embedded in the auricular muscles. And these auricular muscles are what's responsible for the mobility of the external ear, turning it towards the, the sound. We can see the cartilages here embedded in the auricular muscle. Now, the cartilages, of course, are covered with integument, and the integument of the ears is somewhat modified. We have, of course, squamous and sebaceous cells, 
but particularly important and specific to the ear are the ceruminous glands, which are capable, of course, of producing this sticky ceruminous secretion. And this is part of what contributes to the pathophysiology of ear disease when we have patients with otitis externa. Now, a very uh, well-established and classical way of looking at dermatological disease is this that we see here, the primary predisposing and perpetuating causes. And that works very well when we look at the ears because the ears are, of course, just part of the integument. So let's look at what we mean by primary predisposing and perpetuating etiologies. First of all, primary causes are factors that initiate an inflammatory change in the integument of the external ear. They're actually what kicks off the external ear disease. And so that leads to a number of changes in the external ear. We start to see thickening and edema and uh, inflammatory change in the integument of the uh, external ear. And that, of course, can then lead on to the ceruminous exudation, which is so characteristic of external ear disease in the dog. Uh, occasionally, we see uh, otitis external that develops into ulceration, um, but that's probably less common than the more proliferative edematous change that we saw earlier on. So what are some of the primary causes? Well, this time of year, it's probably a bit early, but as we go through into July, August, we're going to see, of course, lots of dogs with foreign bodies, and they create uh, an acute inflammatory reaction in the external ear, and providing, of course, we do what we're doing here, which is to get it removed during the evening surgery and don't leave it there and find it weeks later, it, the inflammatory change is, of course, transient. Parasites can produce a more lasting inflammatory change. My impression really is that these days they're really not so important with the antiparasitocidals that we've got around. But what's really important in this context, the context of the chronic ear, are dermatoses. And dermatoses are certainly the most important cause of chronic external ear disease in the dog. So these are perhaps not dogs that we see during June, July. These are dogs that we see in the autumn with still ongoing grumbling ear disease through into the winter. And these are, for instance, atopic dogs who have a generalized skin problem. And that generalized skin problem is going to make itself most known uh, in the intertriginous regions, in the axilla, in the groin, and so on, and particularly around the ears. So then we have some predisposing factors, and these are things which worsen the inflammatory response in the integument. They're not primary causes, they don't cause the inflammatory change, but they make it a lot worse once uh, the inflammation has started. And in this context, the spaniel ear conformation is always given as the best example because the external ear conformation of the spaniel results in intertriginous changes and that means the poor ventilation and increased frictional contact mean that any inflammatory change in the external ear is going to be either more severe or more prolonged. And of course we always say to owners of spaniels, well the reason your spaniel's got ear disease because it's got long floppy ears. That's really not true because there are thousands of spaniels out there who never get ear problems. However, those spaniels that have a concurrent dermatosis get more severe ear problems because of the, the conformation. So next then we come on to the perpetuating causes and these are factors that prolong the inflammatory response even if the primary factor is no longer present. So they're responsible for taking the disease in a chronic direction. And so they're not, uh, I emphasize, a primary cause, but they can become the primary cause once they become established. So we're thinking particularly, of course, of bacteria such as Pseudomonas and yeast such as Malatitia. And both of these uh, organisms 
uh, only arise once the environment has changed in the external ear and favors the development of bacterial colony. So uh, the first step, the first phase is the inflammatory change and the exudate and so on. And that uh, change of environment favors the establishment of microorganisms such as pseudomonas as, as we see here. Um, do we see primary pseudomonas infections? I don't think we do. Pseudomonas only turns up when it likes the environment. And likewise for Malatitia, if the environment has changed sufficiently to allow it to become established, it can take over and become the, the driver of the disease. Again, do we see primary Malatitia infections in the ear? I think they're very, really very rare indeed. So when we look at medical management, and clearly this is not my area of specialty, we need to think about those etiologies and we need to address and remove the underlying primary cause, whether that's a foreign body or uh, uh, parasites, uh, or in the case of a dermatological disease, identify and remove the uh, underlying disease or to manage it symptomatically with immunosuppressants. Uh, we can, in occasional cases, address any predisposing causes. Uh, for instance, that could mean lateral wall resection. We do it very, very rarely these days, but that's always possible. Uh, and we can medicate any perpetuating organisms, for instance, Pseudomonas and Malatitia. And I think uh, it's uh, controversial, really, just what the role of antibiotics is in managing these perpetuating organisms. And I speak as somebody who has a chronic seasonal uh, allergic otitis externa. And I went through a whole series of ENT surgeons who were very, very focused on antibacterial, anti pseudomonad therapy uh, until finally I found one who understood the underlying uh, allergic disease and managed that. And then the pseudomonas simply disappeared. So let's move on to the decision-making part of, of this discussion. When should we move from medical to surgical management? And uh, this, cynically from a surgical point of view, I, I would say that tends to be later in the year. We tend not to be uh, dealing with the acute ear patients in June, July, August. They're usually patients that are presenting in October, November in, in the autumn. So, you know, at what point do we move from managing the skin problem, from being a dermatologist to being a surgeon. And probably in clinical, general clinical practice, that decision is less politicized than it is in a hospital such as here, where the dermatologists will uh, want to continue to manage the dermatological disease. The surgeons, on the other hand, want to get the quick fix and get paid to, to get it done. But I think it's a very difficult uh, situation sometimes to decide when we move from medical to surgical management. And the, the answer broadly is when we feel we've got to the end of the road and the treatment that we've been using here is not gonna be suitable for the conditions that we find over here. And we usually talk in terms of the end stage ear. We, we start to think of surgery when we got to the end stage ear. What do we mean by the term the end stage ear? We mean when we can identify irreversible changes or intractable disease in either the external and or the middle ear. Now, let, let's start by with the easy bit, which is looking at the irreversible changes in the integument of the external ear. And I think this is probably less problematic in terms of decision making. I think when we're presented with a patient with an ear that looks like that, and then we do some imaging and we've got mineralization of the external canals like that, I think we're all convinced that those are irreversible changes. No amount of medical management is ever gonna fix that and surgery is the best solution. So here in the animation, we can see uh, what's going on. We've first of all got the chronic changes of otitis externa 
or, uh, and then we start to see the more advanced uh, anatomic changes with thickening of mineralization of the cartilages, chronic hyperplastic change in the integument here. So I think once we see that, um, most of us, even the hardened dermatologists, would say it's time for surgery. So we associate one or two breeds with the end stage ear, and we see lots of Labradors with atopic skin, and they end up with ears that look like this, with this proliferative change. Uh, the Westie, not so popular these days, the Westie, but, um, and fewer and fewer of them have the uh, skin problems that they used to have, but uh, we used to uh, see lots of Westies with ears that look like that. Um, and the Sharpe, happily a breed that's gone into something of a decline in popularity. Um, but these dogs present with end stage years very early in life, even at six or 12 months. And we always say that Sharp A was born, carries with a gene to have a total ear canal ablation, a bilateral total ear canal ablation. So those are the irreversible changes of the external ear. The difficult bit, I think, comes when we have intractable disease in the integument of the external ear. And one person's intractable disease uh, represents uh, a very simple solution for a surgeon, but represents a challenge for a dermatologist. And arriving at a decision that these changes, there's no obvious anatomic change, but we've got chronic uh, discharge from the ear. Arriving at the decision that that's an intractable disease can be quite difficult. You know, I think if we've been through the whole gamut of addressing the primary cause, the predisposing causes, medicating any perpetuating organisms, and that's been a failure, then I think it's fair enough to start talking in terms of intractable disease. It is very, a lot more difficult to, to define what intractable is. From a surgical point of view, I would say that a patient has been down two months of vigorous and appropriate medical management and still has discharge from the ear, I think would re be regarded as a failure. I'm sure there are lots of dermatologists listening tonight who will say, nonsense, you just need to get the medication sorted out. And they're probably right. So the other area where we use the term end stage is when we're dealing with irreversible changes or intractable disease in the middle ear which we haven't spoken about much till now. So let's just talk about the anatomy very briefly. The middle ear is, of course, an extension of the nasopharynx, which sits between the external ear and the inner ear structures. And it comprises three chambers. First of all, the mesotympanic chamber here, the middle chamber. Secondly, the epitympanic, which has got the ossicles in here. And then this, the hypertympanic chamber, which we usually referred to as the, the ventral bulla. So we can see this uh, structure here, the external ear. This is where the tympanic membrane is. Here's the mesotympanic chamber, uh, which contains the three membranes, the uh, tympanic, the round and oval, connects with the eustachian tube. And here, of course, is the hypertympanic chamber, the ventral bulla, the epitympanic chamber with the recess up here. Let's see if we can stop that a bit later on. Now, the important thing to remember is that the middle ear is lined with integument, lined with an epithelial uh, cells. They vary in their type. In the bull bulla down here, they tend to be secretory. Uh, up here, they're more squamous. And in the eustachian tube, they tend to be ciliated. So we get mucus secretion from the epithelium here collecting the cellular debris, which is then moved down the eustachian tube to the nasopharynx. Okay, and notice in the dog, we have this bony shelf, which separates the mesotympanic chamber from the hypertympanic chamber. In some dogs, this opening is very narrow indeed. Of course, in the cat, it's, it's barely a, a small slit. Um, but in some dogs, as we see here, it's quite a wide opening. Okay, and here we have the tympanic membrane. 
Okay, so what's the function of the middle ear? Its primary function is sound conduction, and it moves sound from the air-to-air -air interface, the external atmosphere, to the air of the tympanic chamber, from the air in the tympanic chamber through to the fluid interface of the inner ear. And that's done, of course, through the, through the ossicles. So it's a very interesting air, air, air fluid interface. It also has a role in baroprotection, protecting the inner ear structures from sudden changes in atmospheric pressure. And so here we're looking at the inner ear structures. This time, see there how they're related. Sorry, let me just go back to that. Uh, see how they're related to the uh, middle ear structures. So here we've got the ossicles and the epitympanic chamber, the round and oval windows here, and then the inner ear structures. And it's important to understand this anatomy because when we do total ear canal ablation and we do buller uh, lavage and irrigation, we need to stay away from this area here, which is dorsomedial. Okay, it's okay to go into this area, into this area down here, but stay away from the dorsomedial aspect of the uh, tympanic chamber. So what are the disease etiologies in the dog? The dog's very different to the cat, as I'm sure you know, and it's different to the human. In uh, humans and cats, Ascending infections are very, very important, occasionally systemic infections. In the dog, middle ear disease is almost always secondary to external ear disease. So let's see how this happens. The first thing, first change that we have is uh, otitis media, a very severe or a chronic otitis media, which produces uh, microorganisms, usually pseudomonas, the pseudomonas are then able to ingress into the middle ear chamber. Now, how do they do that? Well, in the animation, we show the tympanic membrane ruptured. But do remember that the bacteria can migrate through the integument into the epithelium of the tympanic chamber. And that means you can see dogs with middle ear disease that have intact tympanic membranes. Okay, debris goes into the tympanic chamber we get a purulent process developing, okay, with chronic thickening in the epithelium of the uh, tympanic chamber. Sometimes that becomes so thickened, it's diphtheritic, and that will then give rise to a purulent discharge from the middle ear into the external ear. So that's how we get um, middle ear disease and if we see irreversible changes for instance on imaging like this then that's an end stage ear for sure the intractable disease is again less easy to to determine but if we've got a discharge as we see here from which we get a pure culture of pseudomonas and the tympanic membrane is clearly uh, not intact then we know that that's coming from the tympanic chamber and my, my definition, very personal outlook, is that if you treat this appropriately with middle ear lavage, uh, appropriate antibiotic therapy, and you have not made any progress in this discharge over six weeks, that's an intractable disease. Indeed, I think I'd probably say if you haven't got improvement within three to four weeks, you probably should regard that as an end stage disease. So let's now talk about ear surgery and you know, having identified, hopefully, or uh, given some indication as to how we can select the chronic ears that need to go to surgery, let's talk about the procedures that we could do on the, the ear. And let's just make one or two comments generally about ear surgery. Um, first of all, perioperative, that should be perioperative, not perioperative antibiotics. External and middle ear surgery is always a clean contaminated or a contaminated procedure. It's not possible to get an ear surgery that is aseptic and sterile <coughs> from a, an operative point of view. And therefore, we need to use some perioperative antibiotics. 
Now, here comes some controversy because some surgeons would say the bacteria you're most likely to encounter is Pseudomonas. So therefore, you should have some anti-Pseudomonad antibiotics on board at the time of surgery. Uh, I'm at the other end of the spectrum, which says that Pseudomonas only turns up when the environment allows it to turn up. If you change that environment through surgery, you will not have Pseudomonas postoperatively. So I use very simple perioperative antibiotics for my ear surgeries. Ear surgery is painful. For those of you that's ever had middle ear disease, uh, it's painful and externally a disease is painful. So we need to use opiates and non-steroidals. Um, we can use local anesthetic into the wounds. There's some controversy about whether that interferes with healing or not. I tend to rely just on opiates and non-steroidals. And the opiates, doesn't matter what the surgery is, we're gonna continue the opiates for 24 to 48 hours and the non-steroidals for at least four to five days. Now, what are the surgeries that we do on the, ex the uh, ear? Well, for the external ear, of course, uh, the lateral wall resection, the lateral wall or ZEP or HINTS procedure, not a procedure we do very commonly these days. But for the external and middle ear, of course, we do total ear canal ablation. And total ear canal is by far the most common procedure that we do on the uh, ear in the dog today. So uh, if I told you that I started practice in the uh, 1970s, most of you will be falling around laughing because you weren't even born then. But we didn't understand the dermatological aspects of ear disease then. And so it was a general rule that if a patient turned up more than twice with ear disease, we did ear surgery. We did lateral wall resection. And so we used surgery as a prophylaxis for recurrent ear disease. And of course, that's no longer the case. We don't use surgery in a prophylactic role anymore. We use it for managing the chronic ears. What did lateral wall set out to do? Well, it changes the structure and conformation of the external ear. It therefore addresses the intertriginous disease and theoretically removes a predisposing factor. And in theory, there is no doubt that lateral wall resection should be a very successful part of managing ear disease along with dermatological management. And it doesn't really matter whether you do a, a ZEP or a HINTS or whatever. Uh, the principle of the procedure is really pretty simple. We take in the lateral wall, we open it to expose the uh, horizontal canal. But what we're doing much more importantly is removing the intertriginous, the opportunity for intertriginous disease. In reality, we know that at least 50% of lateral wall resections end in failure and probably much more than that. I guess maybe 90% if we really apply the right criteria of success. So why do lateral wall resections, which ought to be fantastically successful, why do they fail? And this is me on, on a bad day after a couple of surgical failures. Well, lateral wall resection, in contrast to total ear canal, is a very painful procedure. And we used to see lots of wound complications in the first week postoperatively. So many of these failed because the wound would break down. Uh, the outcome of pain, of course, is, is self-trauma. Uh, quite a few of them failed because I think we didn't recognize uh, some time ago the importance of chronic middle ear disease and how it very often accompanies chronic external ear disease. So no amount of surgery to the external ear is going to fix middle ear disease. But the most important reason for lateral wall resections to fail is chronic skin disease. And if we don't recognize and address the underlying primary cause, then this is what happens when you do lateral wall resections. They go to hell in a handcart over the next few weeks and there's chronic proliferative change due to atopic disease in the external ear. So lateral wall resection is something we do very infrequently. 
It's rarely a successful treatment on its own. Uh, I think there are some indications, but only if you're prepared to use concurrent medical management to address the underlying primary cause. So what, what is ear surgery today? Well, ear surgeons simply uh, are there to be the wreck salvagers. Um, we don't have anything to do with prophylaxis or management of acute ear disease. We're there simply <clears throat> to salvage what's left when we have intractable disease or irreversible change. So total ear canal ablation then is a salvage solution for irreversible change, intractable disease in either and or the external and or middle ear. So for proliferative changes like that or for middle ear disease such as we see here, it addresses both the primary, the, sorry, the chronic proliferative change and the secondary disease that goes with it. So what are the indications for end stage, sorry, for total ear canal? First is the end stage external ear that we've talked about. Secondly, chronic middle ear disease, recalcitrant middle ear disease. And occasionally this condition, paraaural abscess, which is essentially a middle ear infection, which drains in the paraaural region. And very seldomly we do it for tumor disease. We do it very commonly in the cat, uh, but not so commonly in the dog. So what can we say about total ear canal? We can say, this is, this is my German wirehead pointer. He was very, uh, he settled down for about five seconds whilst we took this picture. Total ear canal has a very high success rate. If we do it for the right reasons, in the right hands, it has a very good predictable success rate. And this is what surgeons like. They can predict the outcome. It's a permanent solution with a very uh, predictable outcome. However, the procedure has lots of potential complications. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, many people reg still regard total canal as a bit of a tricky procedure that is best left to specialists or at least people who have a special interest in surgery. What I want to do tonight is convince you that total ear canal is not just for people who have a special interest in surgery. If you follow one or two, just one or two basic principles, you can do very safe total ear canal ablations. Now, one of the reasons, one of the basic principles of doing a safe total ear canal is to not, not do this, lateral bullet osteotomy. So notice I talk about total ear canal ablation. I do not ever talk about total ear canal ablation with lateral bullet osteotomy. And most of you are saying, well, it says in the textbooks that we should do this. We should remove the lateral part of the tympanic bullet. And my very strong advice to you is not to do that. It's an optional extra. Very occasionally we have to do it. And it's not in the least bit important for the success of the procedure. I think over my career, I've done some four and a half thousand total ear canal ablations. I only did lateral bullar osteotomy in the first 11 or 12. And I have not uh, had any complications. Bullar osteotomy adds to the complexity, increases the risk of complications. So let's just very briefly go through the procedure. We make our incision over the vertical canal. Remember, if you've got uh, proliferative disease in the pinna, to include all of that disease tissue there. I don't know if you can hear, but I've got a very noisy sparrow sitting outside my office that I may have to go and discourage in a moment. So make our incision over the vertical canal, include all the diseased tissue. Now, we need to mobilize the external meatus, the cartilages of the external meatus. And the one or two hints I would suggest, first of all, make sure that you use at least two gelpies. Anything that's better than two gelpies or three gelpies to give you the kind of exposure that you need. The second important tip I would say here is as you do your resection, uh, dissection, 
you're separating the muscle of the, the auricular muscle from the cartilage. Now, please don't take any shortcuts to speed things up by cutting through muscle. Always, always, always stay close to the cartilage. You can use little mosquito forceps to do a blunt dissection. People get into trouble when they start take shortcuts and they cut through the muscle to speed things up. And that's how you end up in trouble, losing landmarks and cutting facial nerves and encountering the retrogenoid plane. So always stay as close as you can to the cartilage. If you can see clean cartilage, you will not have complications. Trust me, I'm a surgeon. Now, the one bet noir that everybody worries about, and probably quite rightly, is of course the facial nerve. So the dog's head's facing in this direction. Here's the annular cartilage. There's the bony prominence, the external osseous prominence. And here is the facial nerve coming out of the style of mastoid foramen and looping across the face here. So there is no doubt that the style of mastoid foramen is very close to where you want to dissect. My advice to young surgeons when they start to do total ear canal is for the first 10 dissections, make a deliberate effort to dissect and see the facial nerve. Okay, you don't have to retract it. Just make sure that you do enough dissection to see where it is. And then forever on, you don't have to dissect it. And you don't see it and you never damage it. Uh, I don't think that the majority of facial nerve injuries occur when people are dissecting the cartilage here. I think as we'll see later on, most of the facial nerve injuries occur when people start to do lateral bullar osteotomy here and they start to do more ventral dissection. So recognize where the facial nerve is, make friends with it, and you won't have any problems. Now, when we reset the external meatus from the ear, we do it roughly along this plane, um, level with the, that little bony prominence that we saw. So we cut and remove the external ear. We're left with this integument lining the opening to the tympanic chamber. We make the resection as close as we can to here, but you're always going to be left with that integument. So here again are some tips. These are the instruments that I use for dealing with the integument and the tympanic chamber. So first of all, over here, we have a Volkman spoon and notice it's oval in shape, has a very, very sharp edge. And I use that for curatage of the integument. The rangeurs I don't use for lateral bullar osteotomy. I'll tell you what I use them for in a moment. The dental instruments we use for cleaning the tympanic chamber and getting into the hypertympanic chamber, and then the uh, crocodile forceps and the gelpies or mini gelpies or sternomastoids uh, for removing any debris. And in addition to that, we need some irrigation and suction. So we always leave this small rim of integument here, okay? And if you leave that behind, it will form a focus for chronic infection. So it has to go, has to go. And we use the uh, Volkman spoon to curette down to the bone to loosen that. Everybody thinks when they're working here that this is a circular opening. And it's not. It's this shape. Okay, it has this little groove ventrally here. And if I just go back, we can see that groove there. So it has that little groove. And in the groove is the most difficult part of the integument. So people find it easy to remove integument around here. This is where they come unstuck. So make a big effort. And what you can do is to use the rangeur that we described not to do bullar osteotomy, but to remove this little prominence, bony prominence here in the region of that uh, integument. And that will allow you to get it out much more easily. So that's what we use the rangeurs for. <clears throat> so when we're looking at um, the uh, the surgery, what we want to see is this bone here is completely clean. Let me just see if I can magnify that up. Okay, what we want to see is this is completely clean bone. 
and no integument is is left here okay so that's really important um, now we need to clean the tympanic chamber sometimes the tympanic chamber will be completely clean that's fine but if it's got debris in it we need to flush that out <clears throat> and we do that with warm saline we flush it in I just trickle it in down the outside. I don't flush it into the chamber, just trickle it into the outside and then suction it out. Now, you may have to do that 10, 20 times until the tympanic chamber is clean. And also at this time, you can use the little dental instruments to probe into the hypertympanic chamber here, dislodge any debris. If the epithelium is dipferitic, we can scrape that out. Okay, so it's perfectly safe to go ventrally. It's okay to go cranially. It's okay to go caudally. We can go a bit dorsally, but do not, do not go craniodorsal because that's what will take you into the oval and round windows and cause inner ear problems. Okay, let's just talk, dismiss this nonsense about lateral bullar osteotomy. And when total ear canal was originally described, it was described with lateral bullar osteotomy. Why is it necessary to open up the tympanic chamber like this? Well, originally it was suggested that you need to allow vascular ingress, and that just demonstrates the uh, ignorance of people who suggested that because the epithelium of the tympanic chamber brings its own blood supply, it can reform. You don't need to do bullar osteotomy to remove to get vascular supply, it has its own vascular supply anyway. You don't need to do this to remove debris from the tympanic chamber because if we understand the anatomy, then we can just reach in with our dental instrument, clean out the debris and flush it out okay so it's a complete myth and actually increases the risk of complications you can see here how much we're having to traction the facial nerve to get this kind of access so my view is it's completely unnecessary it's an optional extra um, it's <clears throat> what we would call a sledgehammer to crack a nut in europe they talk about a cannon to kill a sparrow but it's overkill to the nth degree. Why? Because we can clean the middle ear without lateral bullar osteotomy, and it has its own vascular supply. Now, here's some data which really, I think, should drive this home for you. If we look at complication rate, reported complication rate for total ear canal with lateral bullar osteotomy, complication rates range from 21% to 82%. And bear in mind, the most recent, this was less than 10 years ago. If you don't do bullar osteotomy, you have a much more acceptable complication rate. Specifically, if you look at facial nerve injury with bullar osteotomy, it ranges from 5 to 35%. If you don't do lateral bullar osteotomy, you don't have facial nerve injuries. Okay, so I think this is the strongest possible argument for me to say to you, don't do lateral bullar osteotomy. Why make the surgery much more complicated than you need to? Now, in terms of wound closure, we use the auricular muscles, just simply close down the, the dead space, uh, try and avoid the facial nerve. Occasionally, we see patients with facial nerve injuries postoperatively, and what we find is a piece of suture through the, the facial nerve. So keep an eye on it as you do a closure. Surgical drains are not indicated. If you've done a good curatage and removed all the disease tissue, there will be no drainage. So don't put drains in. Uh, correct drainage is difficult. And again, drains add to the complication rate. Don't do it. There's no need. Postoperatively, this is really important. Uh, the most important part of the surgery, it's comparatively simple surgery. But the post-operative part is really very important. These patients need analgesia. They need opiate. They need non-steroidal. You need to prevent self-trauma with these uh, patients. Ear surgery is painful, and we need to remember that. If we address it adequately from the pre-operative period onward, we won't have any problems. 
Um, now, let's talk about some of the complications, which include facial nerve injuries, bleeding, vestibular syndrome, chronic infections. First of all, facial nerve injury. We've looked at this and we've said, here's the opening to the tympanic chamber. Here's the stylomastoid foramen. Here's the facial nerve. Okay, if you don't do lateral volar osteotomy, I don't think you'll have much chance of hitting the nerve. But I always train my surgeons to check immediately postoperatively. So we check for a blink reflex. If there's a blink reflex, that's great. If there isn't immediately postoperatively, then you have facial paralysis. Now, the reason we do it immediately postoperatively because some patients develop facial nerve paresis in the postoperative period. So if the patient had a blink reflex immediately postoperatively, but doesn't have one 24 hours later, that's nothing to worry about because it, it's just a paresis, it will get better. Okay, bleeding. Uh, the most common source of bleeding sits in front of the opening to the tympanic chamber. This is the retroglenoid vein. It drains the cranial vault here. It's one of the few veins that I know which drains like and bleeds like an artery. Okay, and the problem is if you damage that as you remove, clean the integument here, this vessel retracts into the tunnel and continues to bleed like hell. The solution is very simple. We get a little bit of bone wax, as we've got here, pack it into the tunnel. Okay, very simple solution uh, to what can be quite significant bleeding. Occasionally we have reports of people damaging the internal carotid artery. My advice is, if you see a vessel that looks like the carotid artery, close the surgery up and send it to somebody who knows what they're doing because you should never cut any, come anywhere near the internal carotid artery unless you do lateral bullar osteotomy. Okay, neurological problems, vestibular syndrome, border syndrome, very common in the cat, of course, very rare in the dog, unless you do some overly aggressive tympanic curatage. Chronic infection usually means that we've left some integumentary infected integument behind. And what we get are these chronic discharging sinuses. Three or four weeks after the surgery can be longer than that. Bit of a pain in the neck. Paraaural abscesses are essentially chronic infections like this. Okay, the surgery is to go back and find that integument that you left behind and clean out the tympanic chamber. And that's easier said than done because this time there are no landmarks. The best advice I can give you is either get somebody else to do the surgery, but if you have to do it, use the zygoma as a landmark. Follow the zygoma down. As the zygoma terminates at the TMJ, there's the opening to the tympanic bulla. So use that to find the integument. Um, owners quite often want to know what their dog's hearing will be postoperatively, and most assume, indeed most vets tell the owners, your dog will be deaf after surgery. That's not necessarily the case, um, because the hearing structures in the inner ear are still intact, hopefully. Uh, if you do electrophysiological studies postoperatively on these dogs, you find that the bone conducting hearing is still present in 90% of cases, 95% of cases. So they have some rudimentary hearing. Um, and sometimes if you've cleaned the tympanic chamber, you can even measure air conducted hearing. But the bottom line is, if you have a dog with an end stage ear full of debris and you do a total ear canal ablation on it, most owners don't really notice any change postoperatively. Okay, so those I think are the most important complications. And I hope that I've encouraged you to understand that if you follow some basic principles in terms of clean dissection with the cartilage, uh, stick to the cartilage, uh, don't do lateral bull or osteotomy. Um, this is a procedure which I think, you know, most of us should be capable of doing. Uh, obviously not to the, the dermatologist, but those with some surgical bent with us will uh, see. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll try and deal with them. I'm just going to have a 
little glass of wine. Philippe, are you going to moderate? Of course, of course, absolutely. So uh, please uh, uh, hurry and put your questions in the chat such that I can uh, refer those to, to Dick White. Uh, thank you very much, Dick. That was a very, very interesting uh, coverage of this particular condition and, and a new view at uh, the surgical approach. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, I, I learned a lot myself at uh, not touching the, the the bulla, which was something that, you know, we were taught to do. Uh, so anyway, um, if you don't mind, I, I have a couple of questions just to initiate. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I remember dealing myself, you know, uh, with uh, chronic ear disease occasionally. Uh, and I remember that we were doing a lot of flushing to treat medically. And, and that was something that was commonly done. And I was wondering if that's something that you advise to do and when and how would you proceed with flushing uh, procedures? I think I think that's a very interesting point because ear flushing is done at this time of year very commonly in in the management of, of ear disease and I think properly done it can be a very valuable part of managing acute otitis externa. The problem I think is that very often when people flush the external ear they're using probably unsuitable products. And the safest thing really to flush the external ear is isotonic saline, nothing else. The other problem I think that uh, people encounter is because the external ear is full of debris, they don't have an opportunity to visualize the tympanic membrane before they've actually done some damage to it or flushed and uh, perforated the, the membrane. So I, I think I am I'm very much in favor of external ear flushing. It needs to be done carefully, slowly, repetitively, um, making sure that you can visualize the tympanic membrane. It may not be there, of course, um, but I think there are many situations one can think of where ear disease has been exacerbated by external ear flushing. And I have a particular interest in this because there's a, a paper in... Uh, in human medical journals last year in The Lancet, uh, which pretty much said the same about human GPs. Human GPs refuse to look at your ear until the human medical nurse has flushed your ear with olive oil. And I mean, absolutely the most dangerous thing possible to do is to pressure flush the external ear with, with olive oil. So, um, you know, the, the human uh, uh, clinicians are just as guilty, I think, as we are of, of damaging the external ear. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, I, I'm just uh, looking at some of the questions that come from the audience, I would say. Um, and the question is, you know, uh, how successful are vertical canal ablations? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and I I didn't uh, address vertical canal ablation, um, for in terms of brevity, but fundamentally, a vertical canal ablation I would put alongside uh, lateral wall resection. Vertical canal takes away the proliferative change which lateral wall resection doesn't do, um, and it obviously leaves us with just the horizontal opening. So in that sense, vertical canal should be more successful than lateral wall resection. However, I think if we rely on vertical canal ablation as the only solution to the ear disease, you will be disappointed and you'll get the proliferative changes in what's left of the external ear. So it's in the same category as lateral wall resection. It's probably more successful because it removes the proliferative change, but it's not a complete solution on its own. Okay, thank you. I, I found two questions that are sort of uh, related one to the other. Yeah. So I'm going to ask both uh, together. Is that okay? Yes. The, the first one is related to the use, uh, the usage of bipolar cautery to control bleeding. And the other one is also related to, to a certain extent to dissecting uh, by asking 
is blunt dissection and cold dissection preferred to um, new innovating technologies such as air plasma. And the person is asking about one mitis, which is the name of the device that using yeah. air plasma for dissecting. Do, do you have any comments on both those questions? Electrocautery and then, you know, fine tune yeah, I, dissection. I mean, I think I think bipolar cautery is what I routinely use for my total ear canal ablations. Um, I would never use a cutting cautery unless we really got into trouble in a chronic cocker spaniel ear. So absolutely bipolar is, is the way to go and identify the vessels and just be patient and do the dissection. Now, you're absolutely right, whoever's asking the question, there are more modern cutting techniques which are much more localized and do far less damage to the surrounding tissue. And air plasma is obviously one of those. And I mean, I'm obviously too old to give you a lot of experience, but from what I've seen of air plasma, uh, it does a very good localized job. However, I would say, <laughs> When you start to get down to the annular cartilage, uh, the safest thing in the world is a pair of mosquito forceps. So blunt, blunt dissection. Yeah, I think, you know, when you're dealing with the rest of the year, by all means, uh, use, you know, a cutting device. Um, but once you get into the vicinity of the facial nerve and the retroglenoid vein, that's, that's the time to be patient and use more conventional techniques, I think. I have one more question related. Yeah, sure, please. Uh, one more question, a guy regarding flushing. Uh, uh, Martin Squires is asking uh, about the usage of sodium bicarbonate solution for ear flushing. Okay. Compared I, to saline. Yeah, I, I mean, I think somebody once said the safest thing to put in the external ear is isotonic saline or your big toe you know one's impossible and the other's the right thing to do um there, there are lots of uh, solutions and possibilities to, to use as a stringent for the external ear and i think if you've got a patient which has got ulceration then those may be the kind of patients where you want to use it the worry you always have is the tympanic membrane is very, very delicate, and anything other than isotonic saline runs the risk of causing pathology in the tympanic membrane. So I, I think, you know, you just have to be patient and flush with isotonic saline. If you've got ulceration in the external ear, what I would then use are Q-tips with an astringent solution to deal with the individual areas of ulceration. Okay. One last question, Dick, uh, because I see time is running and I don't want to keep people past, you know, our planned timing. Um, the last question that I have here is regarding ventral bulla osteotomy versus right. lateral versus lateral. Yeah. Okay. So, um, next time, I think we're going to talk about chronic ears in the cat and in the dog. We do total ear canal and hardly ever do ventral buller osteotomy. In the cat, we do lots of ventral buller osteotomies and a few lateral buller um, uh, total ear canals. Why don't we do it in the dog? Well, because fundamentally the disease is in the external ear. So when we're dealing with disease in the ventral buller, that's the result of external ear disease. So we need to remove the external ear. And as we just discussed, you can get perfectly good access to the buller without having to go in a different direction. Now, there are one or two indications for ventral buller osteotomy and cholesteatoma, this chronic degenerative proliferative disease, can really only be managed through a ventral buller osteotomy. Ventral buller osteotomy in the dog is much more difficult than the cat. I hate doing VBOs in the dog. Um, I love doing them in the cat because they're so easy to do. So uh, are there indications for VBO in the dog is the question. The answer is very occasionally, but not in the case of the usual otitis media with external ear disease. 
So there is there is no benefit of doing ventral or osteotomy. Okay, great, great. So I, before I give the few conclusions uh, words to Karen, back to Karen, I would like just to make a couple comments. You showed us uh, some animations that I think illustrate the talk and the the, the topic uh, very nicely. Yeah. Um, and it, I am, of course, biased by saying this, but it's, I am a strong believer that when you are talking to clients in the exam room, if you use those animations or some of them to educate them, to explain them why you need to be doing this procedure, you facilitate their understanding and therefore their decision to move ahead and have the procedure done. So, and, and this is the whole, I guess, the spirit of uh, Visual Care Council. You, you, you use it today to teach us you know, how to proceed, but you know, in, in reality, it is more to educate the clients and to facilitate yeah. their decision. Yeah. So I, anyway. We, we obviously worked on those diagrams, uh, those animations some years ago, because um, I you know, was doing numbers of total ear canal. I would be doing five or six total ear canals every, every session. And I got fed up of sitting with clients, drawing pictures of the end stage ear. And so, you know, something like this, which you can show them in the consult and then email to them, made my life uh, a, a lot easier. And uh, I mean, I still use them today on the rare occasions that I do ear canal surgery. The, the animations really show, um, you know, say a thousand words about what's going on. So, yeah, well, again, thank you so much, uh, Dick. I'm going to my pleasure, let, uh, Karen. Uh, give a, a, a few words as a conclusion. Thank you again. I enjoyed pleasure. it. it. Was great. Thank you. And cheers, Santé. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, well, good evening, everyone. Again, uh, thank you so much uh, to to Professor Dick White. I think we'd like to give him a virtual round of applause and thank you very much to our moderator, Philippe. I really hope you've all enjoyed it and that you share what you have learned today uh, with your colleagues and obviously this is going to go live we'll we'll have a, about 20 minutes and you'll be able to actually retrieve this whole presentation and really i would just like to say you know a big massive thank you i think what's really important as what to reiterate what philippe said that you know visio care services has some amazing tools to help you communicate with your customers and your clients and so for us we'd really like to just remind you that we've some more webinars coming up on the 14th of july we have uh professor dick white back with us again focusing on ears in cats so that's amazing so please join us for that and tell your colleagues and then with a slightly different take um a week later on the 21st of july i'm sure you're all very familiar from with brian falconer from the colorful cpd and he's going to be talking a lot about the whole well-being in veterinary practice and understanding self-doubt which i think you know has been quite topical at this very difficult time in our profession and we want to give you something back that's perhaps a little bit different and that might appeal maybe to some of the nurses or practice managers or receptionists in the team and of course any vets at all so we'd love you to sign up for those for those webinars the only other thing that leads me to be said is you know we wouldn't be a commercial company if we didn't at least try and tempt you to uh, come and find out more about how Visio Care Consult can be of a massive benefit to your practice and to your clients and particularly at the moment where we find that you know, we don't have the same opportunities to have the client in the consult room with us. Consult actually is an amazing tool that you can actually email out to your clients to help them understand surgery or complex procedures or even really simple procedures such as cleaning ears. And I think you've got a brilliant demonstration of the power of the amazing animations. I just know there is nothing else like it. So any of our team are more than happy to come and see you in person if you'd like that, or we can do it all on modern technology with, with Zoom. And if once you've had your demonstration, 
we'd be happy to give you a special offer for attending tonight's seminar and we're calling it the vets dozen so i'm afraid i can't give you virtual cakes anymore uh, one day we will get back into a real room where we can have a real glass of wine with dick and some real lovely nibbles but it just suffice to say thank you gentlemen it's been an absolute pleasure and honor as Visio Care Services to, to have you present to our uh, delegates and participants tonight. And uh, we wish you all a very safe, if not somewhat warm evening. I'm very grateful that the gray skies have stayed away for the thunderstorms, which was my biggest fear tonight. So uh, thank you all very much indeed. And uh, if you have any further questions, you can get hold of us at the Visio Care Services. And I'm sure, Dick, if there was any really pressing questions, you'd be quite happy if we could forward those on to you. Yeah. Okay. yeah so be, if there are any your questions, I'm happy to uh, address them. Um, I guess they send them on to you. Yeah. My, my so, yeah. so if you send them to marketing at visiocareservices.co.uk, yeah. we can just forward them on to Dick. Yeah. And uh, right. thank you, Dick. We really appreciate that. And I know a number of people will be watching this. Uh, a lot of people signed up who perhaps couldn't make it tonight. So, I have one, I, <clears throat> thank you, Karen. I'm sorry. I have one more question, Dick. Yes. What are you What are you drinking? Is your your favorite German wine? It's a German. This is a Weissburgunder, a, a Doctor von Bassermann Jordan from Fouts. Okay. <laughs> I knew it would not be a French wine. I don't drink French wine. <laughs> 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 <Cross. Okay. laughs> that's marvelous thank you, thank you all thank you. Thank you so much. have a very <laughs> lovely evening thank, you. thank, thank you. you very much for your time good Bye -bye. night